Good morning, everyone. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Dimitra Yorgiadu for our non-open uh, webinar today. I would like to brief introduction before giving to uh, screen to her. Dr. Uh, Dimitra Yorgiadu is a principal research fellow and UK research and innovation feature leaders fellow leading the flexible nanoelectronics team in the School of Electronics and Computer Science at the University of Southampton. She also serves as a deputy impact champion and outreach officer in the UK RI Center for Doc Doctoral Training in Machine Intelligence, uh, Department of Materials, Imperial, uh, sorry, Machine Intelligence for Nanoelectronic Devices and Systems. Previously, she was industrial fellow at the Department of Materials, Imperial College, London, working with Pragmatic, a, a, a UK SME, developing flexible radio frequency, electronic devices for the Internet of Things, and Marie Skodowska Curie Fellow at the Department of Physics. Dimitra earned her PhD in chemical engineering, organic electronics from the National Technical University of Athens, agrees, while she holds her BSc in chemical engineering from the same university. She also holds a master's degree in advanced materials science awarded jointly from the Technical University of Munich, Ludwig Maximilians University of Munich and University of Augsburg in Germany. Dimitra's research interests are the fabrication and optimization of the nanoscale optoelectronics devices by applying novel materials concepts and alternative patterning techniques. Today, she is going to talk about flexible nanoscale electronics for greener emerging technologies. Dr. Dimitra Yorgiado, the stage is yours you can share your screen. Thank you very much for uh, your kind introduction. Let me just start sharing the screen. So how does it look? Yes, perfect. All right, so thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, as uh, you kindly said, I'm, I'm currently a principal uh, research scientist at the University of Southampton. Let me just give you an introduction where Southampton is in the UK. Uh, so Southampton is at the south of England, we are here, and uh, we're actually a one hour drive from London and very well connected with uh, the Heathrow and uh, Gatwick airports, if somebody would like to, to visit us. Uh, the city of Southampton itself uh, has uh, some things to show. For example, we are uh, proud of our marina and uh, one can learn about the history if, we, if they walk across uh, the Southampton walls. However, Southampton is most uh, famous, I would say, uh, as the port where Titanic uh, embarked from uh, to go to New York City, although you very well know that they never made it. But this is where the whole trip started. Um, the University of Southampton is one of the top uh, 15 universities in the UK. Uh, it's famous for uh, research uh, intensity, and it's also highly ranked uh, globally. Uh, this university is um, uh, number one in the UK as a business incubator, and we have an innovation campus uh, uh, next to us. My group and uh, myself were based in the Highfield campus, as you can see here is a very green and uh, vibrant uh, Campus, uh, really a nice place to be. So I am in, in the University of Southampton, I am uh, uh, based uh, at the School of Electronics and Computer Science. Our school, uh, incidentally, this year celebrates the 75th anniversary since uh, uh, their founding. And uh, it's, uh, it's also highly ranked uh, in the UK for uh, both electrical and electronic engineering, as well as uh, for computer science. Um, we're proud to be neighbors, the, the electronics and computer science, to the Zeppler Institute's uh, clean room facilities, which actually makes our life uh, easier uh, in terms of research. 
The Zeppelin Institute uh, comprises three distinct clean rooms, the Southampton Nano Fabrication Center, as well as uh, two more clean rooms, uh, which are more flexible in terms of uh, what kind of materials one can bring in. And they have uh, overlapping capabilities. Uh, there are also several other labs, uh, like uh, uh, the Silica Fiber Lab, uh, the Novel and Compound Glass Lab, uh, and, uh, and so on. As um, the Zeppler is uh, hosting also the Optoelectronics Research Center, which is a research center very famous world, world uh, known for the development of uh, optical fibers. Uh, in the Southampton Nanofabrication Center, this is uh, we, it's uh, the, nano, the Southampton Nanofabrication Center is one of the premier clean rooms in Europe. It's housed in a purpose-built 820 square meter clean room. And um, we have uh, a combination of uh, lithographies can be performed there, combining both optical and D-beam techniques, which uh, allows us, uh, allow us to reach a resolution uh, down to, uh, I'm writing five nanometers here, but recently we acquired a novel E-beam lithography tool, which can actually go as, uh, take uh, um, they take us down to three nanometer or even less than that. Uh, it's been currently installed. There are thin film deposition uh, uh, capabilities and a large suite of uh, characterization techniques for the thin films we're, and the devices we're developing there. So my particular uh, lab uh, is the Flexible Nanoelectronics Lab. And um, it comprises mainly a thin film deposition glove box with a spin coater and hot plate uh, for our work uh, based on organic materials. Uh, we have an advanced um, thin film characterization uh, suite, uh, which uh, mainly comprises an electrochemical AFM inside a glove box, uh, which allows us not only to map the topography of films, but also other properties like mechanical, electrical properties, or material properties uh, based on the mode of this uh, AFM we choose to use. And uh, it's also electrochemical AFM as it allows uh, uh, battery research uh, in situ uh, during charging and discharging the battery. Uh, we have also UV vis absorption and fluorescent spectroscope capabilities, as well as the Raman microscope. Uh, recently, we also acquired an electrical and optical characterization suite uh, for the characterization, for the full characterization of LEDs, photodetectors, uh, and solar cells. So, this is mainly the instrumentation of uh, my lab. And um, in my lab, we basically develop uh, the flexible, smarter, and greener electronics uh, of the future, which uh, will be lightweight, conformable, and smarter than the electronics we, we know today. Uh, we follow an uh, interdisciplinary path, uh, which merges nanofabrication with uh, non-toxic materials engineering and uh, extensive device characterization so that we can add functionality in our electronics and uh, really achieve the breakthroughs in uh, uh, emerging fields like uh, neuromorphic engineering and uh, the internet of everything. So today I will explain more uh, about what we do. First, I will introduce uh, a, a technique that uh, I have developed since my times at uh, Imperial College London when I worked at the group of uh, Thomas Anthopoulos, so who, is now, who has now moved uh, in house. And uh, I will uh, give some details on several applications that uh, can be enabled by, by this technique. First of all, first of all, I would like to answer the question uh, why use uh, nanogap electrodes uh, in the first place. So most of the conventional uh, structures used for electronic devices uh, have uh, this vertical configuration, as you see here, when you have the active layer sandwiched between two metals. Uh, when I'm talking about nanogap coplanar structures, I'm talking about a structure that looks like this. You have metal, the two metals sitting on the same plane, and then a, a short, very short gap uh, in the range of 10 to 20 nanometers is separating those two metals and the active area is considered the area between those two metals. So why nanogap electrodes instead of vertical ones? It has already been proven uh, that uh, nanogap structures fabricated uh, like, like this, in this configuration, electronic devices uh, have given rise to electronic devices like uh, rectifiers, switches, and transistors, and uh, they can uh, bear lower fabrication costs, uh, they have uh, potential for lower power consumption, a higher efficiency, and a higher level of integration. Uh, but most importantly, as I will show, 
they hold promise for much faster operating speed due to this uh, shorter distance between uh, the two electrodes. Uh, however, the why one of the reasons why we don't see them more often is that nanogap electrodes manufacturing methods are generally not scalable. scalable. Uh, nowadays, if we want to fabricate a nanogap uh, device, we would uh, mainly use uh, e-beam lithography, as I mentioned before, where you can really go down to nanometer length uh, gaps, especially if we combine e-beam lithography with uh, mechanical controllable brake junctions and focused ion beam lithography. Uh, however, in this manner, we can get uh, symmetric electrodes. Uh, the equipment is complex and expensive, and it's time consuming to fabricate uh, these uh, gaps in the first place. Then there are also electrochemical approaches. With electrochemical approaches, one can get uh, asymmetric electrodes. This means different metals uh, on the same plane. However, sometimes there are toxicity issues based on the chemicals uh, used in the process and uh, uh, consistency can also be a problem. There are also scanning probe lithography techniques, uh, such as uh, atomic force microscopy lithography and the uh, scanning tunnel in microscope uh, based brake junction. With these techniques, one uh, can actually get atomic scale gaps, which means even shorter, uh, below nanometer and very uniform gaps. However, this is a very slow process. It's not suitable for upscale. And that's why this is mainly used uh, for uh, research purposes. Uh, today, I will introduce you a novel technique that, uh, that has more advantages than the ones uh, I showed you before. Uh, it's a high throughput technique, and one can fabricate coplanar, large aspect ratio, metal nanogap separated electrodes with a distance uh, of about uh, 10 nanometer. This is called adhesion lithography. And um, as the name reveals, this technique is based on the modification of uh, surface adhesion forces with the uh, uh, by using self-assembled monolayers, the so-called SAMs. What is a SAM molecule? A SAM molecule is an organic molecule, like uh, the one shown here, which uh, bears a functional head group. The functional head group can attach to the first metal, and then the rest of the molecule is a hydrophobic tail, just a hydrocarbon chain, long one, that does not bind to any metal. However, when we deposit this uh, organic molecule on top of one metal, the adhesion properties of a second metal that would be deposited on top of it and come in contact with this long alkyl uh, chain uh, would change. And I will explain right away how this works and how we can uh, get our nanogap electrodes using uh, this uh, molecule. Uh, we start by the with our substrate. Our substrate uh, can be glass, can be flexible, can be any type of substrate really. So we start by depositing our metal and then we pattern it. We pattern to the desired shape uh, with standard optical photolithography. And then the patterned substrate, we dip it in the some solution. This is one of the organic molecules I showed you before. It bears, uh, for example, if we start with aluminum, if this metal one is aluminum, the aluminum has a native oxide always on top, an alumina layer, a very thin alumina layer, and the phosphonic acid, which is the head group of uh, the SAMA we chose in this case, uh, has the tendency to attach onto the native oxide of the aluminum and, uh, and bind selectively only to that, but not onto the substrate, uh, while the long alkyl chain uh, will uh, remain on the surface. So at the end, after I finish the, uh, after some hours, we will end up with a structure looking like this, the sum surrounding the metal, but the substrate uh, being uh, free from sum. So what we do next is we deposit our second metal, for example, a different metal, gold. And uh, this would go everywhere. We don't use a mask. We don't use any pattern technique, just a blank deposition on top of, uh, of, the, of our substrate. And then on top of that, uh, we apply quite simply a polymer, which uh, is a type of glue and let it dry for a couple of minutes. After it dries, uh, we peel this glue off. And what happens is that uh, along with the glue, as we remove it, we remove part of the metal, which is in contact with some functionalized first metal. This happens because the adhesion forces now between the second metal, gold, and the sum are weaker. 
And, this, and that's, this is the reason why it's been removed. While the part of the metal, which is coming in contact with the substrate where there is no sum, stays on the substrate because the adhesion forces are stronger. Uh, then we can get rid of the sum uh, on the metal just by cleaning uh, the substrate with the UV ozone, exposing it to UV ozone and uh, uh, removing this organic part from here. And this way we end up with two clean metals in the on the same plane separated by an empty nanogram. Uh, then we can use these substrates as uh, our platform to deposit uh, with solution-based methods uh, our active material for example, spin coat uh, from their solution and, and end up with a complete uh, uh, electronic device based on uh, this uh, active material we chose. Um, with uh, this technique, we can actually form a very homogeneous uh, nanogaps. You see here some uh, scanning electron microscope uh, images which show that uh, there are no distinct uh, protrusions or pointed edges along the electrode walls. Uh, something which uh, can be seen uh, in nanogaps derived from other techniques, for example, from electrochemical methods. Um, it's uniformity. What, what you see here or here is, for example, uh, comparable to the electron beam lithography in nanogaps. But as you can see from the process steps I described earlier, uh, it's much, it can be much cheaper and much faster. And also, we can, I, I showed you that it can be easily done with uh, asymmetric electrodes. Of course, it can be done with the same metal as long as your, as your second metal is the same as your first. Um, there is a great versatility in the design patterns uh, we can use because the initial pattern, uh, if that will be an interdigitated structure, if that will be a circular structure, or if that would be, for example, the London skyline, as we have done here just for fun, uh, is uh, defined by the first photolithography pattern and uh, the mask uh, we, we designed for this step. Um, here, for example, if we have a closer look uh, at the tower bridge with an SEM, we see that at this interface, we have the two metals separated by short gap. Again, SEM is not uh, enough, it's not powerful enough, and it doesn't have the resolution to allow us to accurately measure the gap. But if we do, if we make some uh, a TM, a transition, transmission electron microscope uh, measurement, we see that uh, the two metals are actually separated by a gap of about uh, 10 nanometers, as expected. Another advantage is that we can apply this technique in both rigid, but more importantly, on flexible substrates. And we have uh, shown, uh, we have demonstrated uh, successful application of this technique on different types of, uh, of substrates, uh, as well as uh, on large uh, uh, scale uh, wafers, uh, in, not only on, uh, on small uh, substrates like these ones. So this technique was proven to be easily scalable. We can upscale to, um, to six uh, up to eight inch uh, wafers. And that's something I proved together with uh, a company I worked uh, in the past years uh, who was uh, interested in um, uh, using this uh, technology for uh, radio frequency diodes. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, this takes me to the next uh, part of my presentation, which is the application. And since I already mentioned uh, the RF diodes, I will start uh, with this. Uh, the reason we're interested in radio frequency diodes is because we can actually, we are actually already using them everywhere. Uh, we're, we're using them uh, when we use our uh, wireless, uh, our Bluetooth, uh, our contactless cards, our FOBs, FOB keys, uh, when we pay the tolls remotely. And we will keep uh, needing these kind of applications in future applications, in future uh, entertainment, for example, like uh, AR and VR applications. Uh, so far, we are familiar with the 4G technologies. We know we have slowly uh, transited to the 5G technology, and we're heading in the next few years towards 6G. What differentiates those uh, three technologies communicate in the field of communication is basically one of the things uh, that I would like to highlight here is the different uh, spectrum of uh, the different spectrum 
of frequencies that uh, are being utilized in each one of these spectrums. So initially we used the frequencies below three gigahertz. Now with 5G, uh, we, there is a requirement to, to use uh, frequencies, uh, to utilize frequencies up to 100 gigahertz. And the 6G um, revolution will uh, require even higher frequencies uh, to be utilized. Um, this will also enable applications in the Internet of Things, where all devices will be connected to each other or to the cloud and uh, to, to, to the users, to, to us mainly. Um, uh, so how does this work? Uh, where does the radio frequency diode come into play? Let's uh, explain briefly an example that we are all familiar with, which is the, the contactless a smart card, which looks more or less like this. The reason for this shape uh, is that uh, the antenna required for this application has this shape. That's why we keep this um, rectangular shape in our credit cards. However, the chip is really small. Uh, the chip is really small and it uh, comprises uh, also the, apart from other electronic components uh, and chips and transistors that uh, do the processing on the information, the wireless part, the wireless communication part comprises a rectifier that can rectify the wireless uh, signal harvested by the antenna to a signal that will be useful to power the chip and uh, communicate uh, with a reader and exchange the information needed, for example, when we try to pay uh, for something we bought. Uh, what defines the range of this uh, communication uh, is basically what a figure of merit we call a cutoff frequency. And this cutoff freq frequency is inversely proportional to the resistance capacitance uh, product of, um, of the rectifier. We can understand from the range of applications I showed before that depending on the, on the applications, uh, the, the requirement for, uh, uh, for, for the range of uh, the rectifier changes. For example, we don't want our credit card to, to be able to be read from a distance. We want only to be read when we bring it closer to the reader. On the other hand, when we cross uh, the tolls, we want uh, to communicate at least a couple of meters to reach uh, the reader and be able to pay remotely um, and, uh, and so on and so forth. For example, Internet of Things may require uh, much longer uh, distances. Uh, so defining this cut of frequency gives, uh, opens up the application range uh, to, to a large uh, gamut of different possibilities. And uh, here we can see why uh, the coplanar structures can be beneficial and advantageous to coplanar structures when it comes to radio frequency diodes. As I said, to increase the cutoff frequency, we need to reduce this uh, uh, constant, this uh, resistance and capacitance product. So one thing to do that is to De decrease, for example, in this case, to, to minimize a lot this distance by decreasing the thickness of the film. However, when we want to apply this on flexible substrates and use uh, solution-based processes uh, with materials that can be processed from solution, then this is not always straightforward because if the, if the film is very thin, sometimes we have to compromise its uniformity and create uh, not, not a continuous film, but a film that has many some pinholes. If uh, pinholes and uh, voids are formed in this field, this means that then this structure will not work because it will be shorted. In that case, we can keep this distance small, which is actually the thickness of the film in, the, in, this, uh, in this case, and uh, avoid the formation of pinholes as this will always be, these metals will not be touching in the first place. And this is also compa fully compatible with solution process materials and flexible substrates. On the other hand, by changing the geometry of uh, the electrodes, we can also tune the capacitance and get the best out of the chosen material. As you can see here, we can put different types of materials or even nanomaterials uh, in these gaps, apply a voltage between the two electrodes and uh, have a functioning device. Um, and this is an example of how we have used uh, zinc oxide, a green and uh, generally abandoned uh, material to form uh, uh, zinc oxide uh, diodes. We started with uh, carbon-free uh, 
uh, zinc oxide in ammonia precursor solution and uh, formed the film uh, via spin coating and annealing at uh, relatively low temperatures compatible with flexible to form a continuous and polycrystalline film. Uh, this film showed uh, a high electron mobility of about 10 square centimeter per volt second and uh, in combination with the nanogap aluminum gold electrodes, we formed we, we could form a Schottky diode at the interface of gold with zinc oxide due to the uh, respective energy levels of zinc oxide and the Fermi level of, uh, of gold, which creates a barrier, while the other interface with aluminum uh, would create an ohmic contact due to the Fermi levels being uh, really close. So this is a coplanar structure without pinholes and no electrical shorts. And we can prove that by just applying, as I said, the potential between the aluminum and the gold. And we get this electrical characteristic out. Uh, this is a very nice uh, diode characteristic, which shows that uh, uh, the rectifying uh, uh, properties are, uh, the diode rectifies in the positive uh, bias while it doesn't conduct current. Uh, when we bias uh, the, the diode in the negative uh, regime. Um, we further improved this, uh, this uh, material and this device by doping it with uh, aluminum using, it, again, a solution-based process. And that was simply done by uh, dipping an aluminum pellet in the ammonia solution of the zinc oxide and then spin casting on top of our substrate uh, followed by thermal, by thermal annealing. Uh, we could also scale uh, the width of the diode. Here I show an example how we scaled the width. The width uh, in this, uh, for example, coplanar uh, configuration would be the perimeter uh, surrounding the, the first metal. So if we increase this and we make this larger, and we go from 250 micron to 5,000 micron, actually five millimeter, we see that the current can also scale. And if, I, if we plot here the current at two volts for the different uh, diode widths, we see that uh, there is a linear trend. This means we can easily design uh, our diodes to have uh, the, the current output that would be suitable for, for our application. Um, we were um, thinking whether actually the material fills the gap or it's only bridging the gap. That was a question that uh, troubled us for quite some time. And it was difficult uh, to answer this question without using a high resolution TEM in collaboration with our colleagues in KAUST. So after depositing the zinc oxide, we performed some measurements in the substrates and we see that zinc oxide is actually fill in the gap between the aluminum and gold. And the same goes with the aluminum dot zinc oxide. Here you can see high resolution image, which shows uh, that uh, the aluminum is, uh, is filling the gap, not only bridging uh, the two electrodes and conduction comes basically from uh, uh, charges transported between the two electrodes. Most importantly, uh, after having uh, established a good diode, uh, we wanted to see how these diodes perform in uh, high frequency applications. Uh, we collaborated with uh, a group in VTT uh, where uh, the facilities for measuring at ultra high frequencies up to uh, 100 gigahertz uh, were available. And uh, we saw that uh, the intrinsic cutoff frequencies exceeded 100 gigahertz. What we see here basically uh, is the measurement derived from uh, the VNA that gives us the intrinsic cutoff frequency. The intrinsic cutoff frequency can be uh, defined by the intercept of the imaginary and the real part of the impedance. You see where these two plots uh, uh, merge. This is how we define the cutoff frequency of our device. And uh, this uh, greenish uh, line corresponds to the zinc oxide, while uh, the purplish uh, line corresponds to the aluminum zinc oxide. And we see that the aluminum zinc oxide has indeed much better uh, characteristics, much higher cutoff frequency than the pure uh, zinc oxide, which means that the, pro the approach we used with the doping uh, actually worked. Um, if we scale 
now the diodes as I showed before by changing the, per the, the perimeter of it, um, we see that we can uh, actually even uh, sh sh shift, um, shift the cutoff frequency even further down, uh, which uh, is beyond the measurement capabilities of the instrument we used in uh, VTT in Finland. But if we extrapolate uh, these uh, parts for the imaginary and the real part of impedance for the smallest uh, diode we measured, which was the 500 microns, we can uh, estimate a cutoff frequency of uh, 330 gigahertz. So you can see that uh, these diodes have the potential to, to be applied at uh, 5G and uh, 6G applications in the future. However, the intrinsic cutoff frequency is merely the theoretical limit. It shows uh, what's uh, the highest cutoff frequency we could uh, get uh, if no losses uh, were present. In real life, unfortunately, we have several losses uh, in the cabling and uh, impedance matching uh, issues, which uh, does not allow us to reach uh, that uh, uh, high frequency without performing also some optimization in the whole design. So in these unoptimized uh, designs we, we used, um, we did uh, also measurement of the external cutoff frequency by using a different measuring setup uh, based on a function generator, the radio frequency signal going through a bias T, and then uh, we can uh, see the DC, the DC rectified the signal coming out of this diode. And we saw from the pure uh, zinc oxide that uh, the cutoff frequencies were uh, up to roughly six gigahertz uh, for different input powers. And uh, this is already enough to allow us application in uh, Bluetooth uh, uh, regime. Um, so these diodes, as a small summary of this, uh, small summary of this part of the work, uh, we showed that they have a high intrinsic and a high extrinsic cutoff frequencies based on the aluminum doped zinc oxide and the coplanar nanogap diodes. Here is uh, this graph shows uh, uh, the frequency of uh, a literature re review we performed with different types of materials uh, as compared to their publication here. But and you can see that uh, these are our results. This is the intrinsic. So the highest theoretical cutoff frequency, and this is the intrinsic. We see that even if we compare the, the excuse me, the extrinsic uh, uh, cutoff frequency, it is um, it can compare very well with the uh, the metal oxide based uh, uh, ones derived from solution methods. It's much uh, better than the standard materials used uh, in uh, with flexible substrates, which are polymers and small or small organic molecules. Uh, Why, interestingly, they can also compete directly with state-of-the-art radio frequency Schottky diodes based on uh, more exotic, let's say, materials like carbon nanotubes, molybdenum disulfide, tungsten disenide, and so on. However, uh, we we showed that this can be done just with zinc oxide and abundant material and easy processing uh, steps that, uh, and with this uh, approach, we can actually uh, reach the CMOS integrated Schottky diodes based uh, on silicon. Uh, I will uh, now switch gears and uh, move on to a different type of application, which is uh, the photodetectors. Um, we, we have also demonstrated uh, uh, different types of photodiodes that uh, span the entire spectrum. Uh, by choosing the relevant material, a material that can uh, um, absorb, for example, in the UV uh, part of the spectrum, like uh, uh, this material here, this is called copper thiocyanate, and uh, it uh, absorbs, as you see, in the UV part of the spectrum. So if we deposit this material on top of our electrodes, we see that uh, it can respond only to the UV light. This is the responsivity of uh, the photodiode and the responsivity is high uh, when we apply this uh, light in this region, while it doesn't respond at all when we apply visible light. 
this is uh, the diode characteristic in the off state when uh, we do not, uh, when we keep it in the dark. And uh, this is uh, the IV curve we get when we shine a 280 nanometer uh, light on top of this uh, device. The responsivity we achieved is uh, quite high, 80 amps per watt, while it also has a high photosensitivity at minus two volts, uh, which is retained uh, even at very low illuminating uh, intensity. So that was a very effective uh, photodiode uh, uh, in the UV uh, regime that could, for example, be used uh, as a patch to, to monitor the amount of UV light the one has uh, uh, received. Uh, then we moved on to a different uh, family of uh, devices, uh, that is uh, the very well-known materials from the field of uh, photovoltaics, the lead-allied uh, perovskites. Um, we started with this material because, as I said, it was very popular in the photovoltaics community, and we had some very good colleagues from the University of Oxford, and the group of Henry Snyth, uh, who are uh, pioneers in, uh, in this field. So we used this optimized uh, material uh, they provided us with, and this is a material with an absorption spectrum that spans the whole visible regime um, in the spectrum. And we and we've shown uh, different types of uh, light. This is the response. This is the spectrum, basically, of uh, the emission spectrum of the LEDs we used, and all of them. Uh, gave us a very good uh, performance when uh, we illuminated our uh, photodiodes based on this pair of sky with a different uh, wavelength, different wavelength uh, light. Uh, so we showed that with this material we can achieve a broadband, a broadband uh, response to red, green and blue light and use it in a different type of uh, application as compared to the previous one. Uh, we did some uh, material engineering uh, to further optimize that. Uh, for example, we uh, played uh, a little bit with the concentration of the perovskite, and so the response uh, to, to green light. And uh, in this way, we could uh, define uh, the, the concentration that would give us uh, the best performance. And then we elucidated the mechanism why this happened by monitoring this uh, with the atomic force microscopy. And we see that as we increase the, 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 the concentration, uh, the grain size uh, changed. And this was probably the main reason for uh, having this better uh, photo response in this, uh, with these uh, parameters. Um, and here is a graph showing how the responsivity was uh, affected by the change in concentration of the uh, initial solution that was being coated. Um, then, apart from engineering the material and the film, we did some device engineering and we did this by um, changing the width again of our diode. Here, we chose to use uh, some interdigitated substrates, some interdigitated electrodes. You see, for example, on the same substrate, we have different uh, scale uh, of interdigitated uh, electrodes. They all have the same footprint on, footprint or, on the device. So the area they cover on the, on the substrates uh, uh, are the same, more or less, if you compare this with that. But in this case, the total width of the diode is about one meter long. Uh, this is because the distance between the fingers is quite short. While here, as you can see, uh, the distance is very small and uh, is very large, and the whole, the total um, perimeter which defines the width of our diode is uh, much uh, smaller, around in the centimeter region. Uh, so, by doing this, by scaling the diode width, we wanted to see if we can actually get some improvement in the performance. We expected that by scaling it, we will also get an increase in the dark current, which we did, we, we show, because current depends on the uh, width of the diode, diode as well, the dark current. However, um, it was good to see that the dependence of the dark current on the diode width was much lower 
than the dependence of the photocurrent. So we had much higher increase in the photocurrent uh, than uh, in the dark current when we scaled the diode. And this could be due to certain plasmonic effects that uh, play their role. Uh, and this is something that we're currently trying to, to elucidate further with our colleagues in uh, Southampton in the Optoelectronics Research Center. Uh, as I said before, and I hope I convinced you, these diodes are uh, very good candidates for uh, fast response and fast operating devices. So a photodetector, one of its uh, characteristics is the response speed. And we want this speed to be quite fast, to respond fast to, to light uh, uh, when it, uh, it is shown on it. So we tried to monitor and to measure the, uh, these response times, first by shining uh, on and off uh, an LED and, uh, we, and measuring the uh, rise and fall times of our photodetectors. Um, the time scales were kind of uh, longer than what we expected. And we suspected that that was because we may have reached the limits of our LED switching times. Our LEDs were not so fast, so we could not measure anything faster than that with our photodetectors. So we decided to do some transient photocurrent measurements. So in this case, we've shown a, an ultra fast laser pulse onto our substrates uh, using a different configuration, and we measured the decay. Uh, of this uh, photocurrent, and in this way we could actually uh, measure some time, some decay times uh, in the rise and decay times uh, in the range of uh, uh, no hundreds of nanoseconds, which is closer to what we would have expected from these uh, uh, nanogap structures. Um, we also used uh, a different type of material that uh, absorbs uh, at the near IR region, and this is uh, a lead sulfide uh, quantum dot. Uh, it's a nanomaterial, something that would be much more difficult to use uh, with uh, a vertical configuration, as uh, we're not sure how to obtain a very good film uh, uh, and make it very thin. So in that case, that was not a problem. We just filled in the, the nano gap uh, with uh, the solution of the quantum dot. And uh, on top of that, uh, what we did was to functionalize our uh, lead sulfide <laughs> quantum dots with uh, an ethane dithiol ligand. This thiol has uh, the, potential, the, the, the potential to attach to the gold and bind. So we hoped that with this manner, we will manage to have a more oriented uh, filling of the nanogap. And uh, indeed with the TEM, we could uh, see that uh, the a quantum dot was uh, filling the, this uh, part of the, of the gap between the aluminum and the gold. And uh, uh, we, see, we, we see that the photodiode performs, uh, that the photodiode also performs very well. We have a photo response when we shine 850 nanometer light and the high responsivity of 62 amps per watt, while uh, with uh, uh, transient photocurrent measurement, uh, we saw that again, the, uh, the rise time was in the range of uh, 100 nanoseconds. Uh, while the process was very repeatable, if uh, you see here, the, by switching on and off uh, the near IRL laser, uh, we could see that uh, the, the, our photo detector responded uh, quite well. Um, so what's next? Uh, the next step, what I'm working now within my group is we try to use different materials and eliminate the lead from the chemical structure. So we're mostly focused on lead-free perovskites. After we showed the proof of concept with uh, uh, the lead-based ones, now we're more oriented towards lead-free materials. And instead of using the lead-based like quantum dots, we're looking at uh, using near IR absorbing polymers, uh, conjugated polymers. Uh, we're also trying to avoid using uh, toxic solvents and uh, uh, try to find materials that can be processed for more benign solvents. And uh, as, an, as a third step, we uh, want to use uh, cellulose substrates instead of plastic uh, in accordance with uh, the requirements posed in the Green Deal. Um, that was uh, a short summary of our work with photodetectors. I will briefly now talk a little bit about uh, two different applications, solids and uh, mem resistors. Uh, we have also performed light emitting diodes with these nanogap structures. Light emitting diodes uh, 
uh, can be, these nanogabulite emitting diodes can be used, for example, as light sources in scanning and near field optical microscopes, uh, or they could be employed in bioelectronic applications, for example, in photoluminescence based or biochemical sensing. Uh, they could also be used at, at ultra high definition displays in principle, as uh, we could fabricate thousands of miniaturized light sources over large areas. However, this would uh, uh, require uh, an optimization of the whole process to have uh, much improved efficiencies. Uh, we demonstrated um, light emitting diodes based on uh, different polymers. So you see here, this is our substrate. A different type of uh, substrate was used in this case, this uh, simple square. Uh, this is much larger because we don't really need, uh, as a proof of concept here, to have higher uh, to, to have very small features. So this is uh, one times one millimeter, this square. And uh, you see that when we deposit the polymer everywhere, basically, we only get uh, uh, emission of light from the interface of the two metals. And uh, by depending on the type of polymer we deposit on top of uh, these substrates, we get different uh, color light emitted from that. Uh, we applied successfully this uh, process on uh, flexible substrates, as you see here, and the different and some interdigitated electrodes to see also if we will have an enhancement. And indeed, you can see that light is emitted from the plastic substrate uh, for just from the areas that uh, are at the interface of the interdigitated uh, fingers of these uh, structures. These are some uh, IV and uh, LV characteristics. Uh, you see that uh, we have, again, diode characteristics, uh, also in this type of uh, light emitting diodes. However, the light emission starts at uh, relatively high voltages, and this is because the interfaces, are, in this case, are unoptimized. If you're familiar with the organic light emitting, uh, light emitting diodes uh, research, usually, uh, we have several interfacial layers, uh, at least one at its interface, uh, at the anode side and the cathode side, that uh, allows us to tune the and optimize the injection of charges uh, from the anode and the cathode to the home and the loom of the polymer, respectively. We didn't have that in that case. That's why uh, we, we get this uh, high voltage emission. But this is something that uh, can be engineered, and that's something we're looking at. Uh, uh, for, for the future. Uh, what we did already, what we have done is again to apply the scaling in the interdigitated structures and see if this could be of any benefit to us to increase, for example, the emission of light. Uh, we employed the interdigitated electrodes I showed you earlier. Again, this is the same area, but uh, here we have only two centimeter long diode, while here on the same area we have 20. A centimeter uh, long diodes. And we see that the 20 centimeter indeed could give us much higher light output as compared to the very short one. So again, depending if we want higher sensitivity or, we, or if we care about getting more light out, we can uh, design our diodes in the way that will uh, fulfill the requirements of, uh, of our application. Uh, finally, I will uh, talk a little bit about uh, memories, as this is also a field that I'm actively continuing uh, here at the University of Southampton. Um, first, we demonstrated uh, resistive switch in memories based on empty nanogaps. It is well known that uh, empty nanogap electrodes uh, without any active material in between can uh, uh, show a resistive switch in uh, characteristics. And this is because, uh, um, for example, in the case of aluminum-aluminum electrodes, uh, the aluminum atoms uh, could migrate uh, upon application of uh, a high electrical field from one side to the other, form a, conducting, a conductive channel, a conductive filament, and this could change uh, the state of the device from a high resistance state, which is initially when uh, no bias is applied or little bias is applied, to, to a low resistance state, which is uh, after the filament has been formed. So here we, we just for this application, we employed uh, symmetric metals, two aluminum metals. We see that there is still a nano gap in between and we can also prove it electrically because it's isolated and it's not sorted. 
And uh, then by applying a specific set and reset uh, program in our uh, memory store, uh, we could uh, define uh, the, the high resistance and the low resistance uh, state uh, based on the uh, program we, we used to set and reset it. And this uh, had actually a quite uh, good uh, endurance. Uh, which could be repeated, the switching on and off uh, of, the, of the memory for several uh, cycles. However, we thought that this nanogap electrode uh, is not very attractive because it was not very repeatable and we could not very well control it and uh, repeat the same process several times. Uh, so we tried to put the material uh, in the nanogap uh, and see how this would perform. Uh, we, we tried different types of materials. Uh, we tried the zinc oxide as we had already been using it for the RF dials, we were familiar with that. We used several conjugated polymers, which I showed before in the work with light emitting devices. And we also used a carbon nanotube dispersed in a polyfluorine matrix. With all of them, we could uh, observe resistive switching. Uh, some of them performed better, some of them performed worse, but uh, the most interesting part uh, here was in the case of the carbon uh, nanotubes, uh, as you can see here, where in which uh, we could uh, actually uh, define several states and uh, create a multi-bit memory just by changing the reset voltage we used uh, in, in this device. We could also uh, demonstrate, we have demonstrated ferroelectric memories based on a ferroelectric polymer with uh, a very good uh, retention uh, characteristics, uh, as you can see here. This is based on the very well known ferroelectric PVDF uh, TRFE ferroelectric polymer. Uh, so, coming uh, slowly to the end, I would like to just give you an idea of what. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, on my uh, current research project, which is uh, on the optogenetics inspired neuromorphic hardware. The motivation is uh, to embed artificial intelligence uh, everywhere. Uh, you are familiar, I suppose, with the Uber app uh, that uh, allows, uh, that is based on AI software uh, to define the optimum uh, route for uh, uh, for your trip. However, uh, the next step is to implement artificial intelligence directly on the chip and not only using machine learning algorithms. And uh, the big players in the field like Intel and IBM, they have already started uh, fabricating these uh, chips. They call them neuromorphic because uh, they try to emulate uh, the way our neurons uh, work uh, in the brain. And this is supposed to give an answer to the big data challenge, uh, how to handle large amount of data in a short time and, uh, uh, and, and, um, and this would require to have faster electronics in order to, to handle these uh, large amounts of data produced. Uh, the answer to this uh, could be light because light is by default faster than uh, electrons. And uh, what I'm trying to do in my next, uh, in my current uh, re work is to merge photo detection with the information processing and open up uh, new application fields, for example, in uh, artificial vision. Um, just uh, to give a snapshot of uh, what we will do in this uh, project is um, that we're trying to, we're using additional lithography to fabricate again coplanar nanogap electrodes as I showed before and then uh, materials engineering to use materials that can respond to light uh, mainly lead free perovskite materials and other photoactive materials and in this way we try to develop a light controlled multi-level memory store which will then implement it on flexible arrays performing uh, neuromorphic functions. So I will not go into much detail here. I will skip those as uh, I am a little bit where I think I'm a little bit beyond time in time. Uh, just uh, leave you with uh, this question and I hope to be able to answer with uh, the project I'm currently working on, the one I showed you, whether biology inspired greener electronics could revolutionize the future intelligent technologies and bring the applications, uh, these applications in our lives in the next uh, five, 10 years, applications in the field of image recognition, 
machine vision or real-time sensors for self-driving cars. And with this, I would like uh, to thank you for uh, your attention and thank my funders uh, for supporting uh, my work uh, all these years. And also to announce that in my group, uh, we are hiring in the next few months. We have some PhD scholarships uh, available. Unfortunately, this is only for UK-based students, but in case you have, uh, you know of someone through your network, uh, uh, you, you may encourage them to apply. Also, we will be hiring uh, postdoctoral research associates in electronic devices and the specialist technician uh, in flexible electronics manufacturing or the electronic uh, measurement setup. And with that, I would like to thank you again and uh, would be happy to answer any question you may have. Uh, Dr. Dimitri Oryadu, uh, thank you. Now, session is open for questions. You can just speak up or, or raise hand or uh, I think we have a message from chat. Thank you to you, Dimitra. I have one question. Sure. Hi. Um, I saw your future project uh, titles and there were uh, uh, different items, including cellulose substrate, cellulose-based substrate. Did you have any um, work on this subject? Because I was also uh, planning to produce these kind of uh, substrates. And uh, I just wanted the situation where you are now on this yes, subject. Yes, absolutely. So. Um, and, this and, is sorry, and are you open to collaborations? Absolutely, yes, that's why I'm here. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so this nanocellulose work is uh, this is part of uh, PhD students' work. She's working uh, on uh, batteries and using these uh, nanocellulose uh, films uh, as anodes uh, for her batteries. So this is an ongoing work and we want to optimize and use these uh, films as substrates for our flexible electronics uh, we're not so we have the films but we have not yet uh, developed fabricated any electronic device with this because this is part of her phd project which is still in progress in the next um, year i suppose we will have some results with that as well okay if we have some results can we um, collaborate yeah, of course, we could uh, feel free to email me after this talk and uh, okay. give me more details on the areas okay, of thank interest. You. Okay, I will. Uh, I thank have you. a question. Sure. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dimitra, for your talk. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. Um, maybe we, can we go to slide number 30 so I can ask based on, from that kind of uh, slide? Thirty. Yeah, it's just an example. Yes, sure. Yes, almost the... there. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Oh, sorry. Okay. Maybe it's easier if I just go here. Right. Okay. This one. Yeah. So I'm also working in the research of optoelectronics. So therefore, I have uh, I'm very uh, interested in your uh, work of uh, your research. Uh, so based on this um, slide. I also, among other slides also, I noticed that uh, you have uh, always used uh, two types of metal, aluminum and gold. And why is that so? And suppose that if you use the same metals, can you still work in this uh, structure? Yes, so that's a very good question. So the honest answer here is because aluminum gold is the combination we have uh, optimized mainly motivated by our work with radio frequency diodes so we can update because i explained why aluminum and gold are very good with zinc oxide so motivated by this work we optimized in parallel the technique and uh, we can now fabricate aluminum gold electrodes with high yield on uh, wafer scale and uh, for example fabricate on the same wafer thousands of devices that uh, most of them uh, uh, work very well. This is the main reason. Also, by having asymmetric electrodes, this uh, enables you to have uh, uh, diode structures. 
right? Because you have a difference in the work function of the metals and you can obtain whenever you want a diode structure, photodiode, light emitting diode, radio frequency diode, the aluminum gold uh, work functions usually work well with the energy levels of most devices. Now for the memories, uh, you don't necessarily need asymmetric. If you want a capacitive memory, you would prefer to have either aluminum, aluminum, which is cheaper, or gold, gold. We have also used gold, gold uh, metals for that. Um, the process has been uh, applied also to other metals, if uh, that was also part of your question. Um, we have used platinum instead of gold. We have used indium tin oxide, which is a con also a transparent substrate, and it's very relevant to the electronic applications. Um, what different, what other metal? Uh, I think these are the, the main ones. Gold, aluminum, platinum, indium tin oxide. These are the main metals we have uh, used. Uh, and titanium, and titanium also uh, can be used. Did, did I answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you very much. So I, I guess there's the uh, uh, advantages of uh, having the uh, diode effect, uh, for example, you change, you have asymmetrical uh, metal. Yeah, I understand that right now. Uh, following to this slide, uh, I have another question. Um, how does this provost kite resp uh, have a different electrical response uh, based on this structure? It's a very simple structure, yet you can still have a different response for the red, green, and blue uh, emission. Can you explain um, it, uh, the, 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 the background or theory behind this? Yes, so as you can see here, I basically, this is not uh, wavelength selective. Uh, this, uh, no matter if I shine red, green, or blue light, uh, the response is more or less the same. And this makes, sense because it absorbs in this region. So if is, it, is your question that the absorption is not exactly the same? That's yeah, so I'm not sure. Yeah, so so based on your electrical response, I'm looking at the right hand mm -hmm. side. So basically the red, green and blue do not show any differences except then it's uh, totally darkness or there's light. So it, correct, uh, yes. Yeah, I uh, understand it, right? Yeah. Yes, that's that's absolutely right. So because this material absorbs, as you can see uh, here, this is the absorption spectrum of uh, this uh, film, one of the films we used. So it absorbs quite well. It has a high absorbance uh, in at the emission wavelength of these LED sources we, we used. That's why the absorption does not really depend on the light, the, the performance of the photodetector. This material is not selective to one wavelength. It responds to all visible light. If you want a visible photodetector that could respond to any type of light, uh, then this would be the case. And you can use the, this kind of sensors in, uh, in many different applications. There are other applications when you want your photodetector to be selective to only one wavelength. And for this, we would pick a different material, not that one. Uh, we would try to get the material with a sharper absorption spectrum uh, closer to the emission of the source we want to use. And uh, this way, as we did, for example, for the UVBs. Here, when we illuminate with these LEDs, I showed before, the green, the blue, and the, the blue, the green, and the red, the copper thiocyanate does not respond. It responds only when we illuminate with the, uh, the UV LED, which is the, the area where this material responds. The, this material absorbs across the whole visible range, so it doesn't make any difference if we shine red, green, and blue light uh, to that. It absorbs and uh, creates excitons, and the, these excitons are being separated by the field. It's more or less as the photovoltaic uh, works. So you create the photocurrent that can be uh, monitored here. You, you see the photocurrent from the... Uh, uh, from the charges generated uh, upon uh, photon absorption. I don't know if I answered your question or... Yes, thank you very much. Yes, you, you did very well. Thank you very much. Uh, can I ask a question? Of course. Uh, thank you very much, Dimitra. I'm sorry I missed some part of your talk, but 
So I wonder how highly possible to obtain a desired shape after all the recipes. I mean, basically, what's your yield with this uh, addition lithography process? So as I said, we have optimized the aluminum and gold electrodes because it was very relevant uh, for the radio frequency application and the yield uh, we have measured uh, uh, with, uh, with these particular electrodes is about 97%. Th this means uh, in 100 uh, distinct devices based on aluminum gold nanogap electrodes, there are only three that are sorted. Okay, very great. I mean, with that critical dimensions even. Yeah, that, uh, this is the great advantage as compared to electron beam lithography that you can on one go on a wafer scale create thousands of devices and only a few of them will not work. And we are trying to, to further optimize that and reach potentially a 100% uh, yield. This is good. Have you ever considered to make a very sensitive nanogap tunneling junction with this method? I mean, you can make a pentameter uh, sensitive displacement sensors if, if this uh, with this method, I guess. Uh, well, I didn't get what the kind of sensor did you say? So, I mean, I think with that method, you, it's uh, highly possible to make a nano gap tunneling junctions yeah. so that you can use the quantum tunnelings and then you can make a displacement sensors in a over a pentameter uh, sensitive uh, manner. I mean, have you ever considered uh, to make another? Uh, sensors or other chips with using this uh, additional telegraphy method? Yes, actually I showed uh, the ferroelectric tunnel injunctions we have uh, done so far, uh, which uh, in this case, the, mem the memory effect uh, is not due to a filament formation, it's uh, due to the tunneling current uh, from uh, the two metals mm -hmm. due to the short nano gap uh, that changes the, the barrier basically at its interface. Mm -hmm. the, polar the polarization of the material changes and uh, the tunneling barrier changes. So this is one step towards this application. Now how this could be used for sensing application is something we haven't explored so far, but definitely there are so many different applications one could think of uh, if we think of these nanogap electrodes as a platform. Mm -hmm. And I'm open, of course, to suggestions if you have a, an idea you would like to, to explore with me. Yeah, maybe later. Uh, we can communicate. Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, I got another question uh, here. Can I ask one question? Sure. Mm. Regarding the flexible substrates that you talked about, uh, most popularly has been PI or other PET-based materials. Uh, now, mm, with respect to the green deal that you highlighted, uh, has there been any progress in replacing these materials other than cellulose? So, uh, as I said, this is the next step. Uh, we have developed the nanocellulose substrates, but not tested it yet with uh, uh, an electronic device. We're optimizing the film right now for a different application. And when this will be optimized for the battery, it will be basically ready to use it uh, also as a substrate. A big question is whether uh, the additional lithography, for example, could work directly with that, or if we have to compromise and put a, a plastic, uh, these, a, a very thin, polymer layer on top, which is the same as we do with paper, for example. Paper is nanocellulose, but paper substrates, they're very porous and they don't work as, as such. So we need to planarize them and uh, deposit a, a thin plastic film. Again, it's something better than having all of it uh, made of plastic. It's uh, in the uh, towards the direction of reducing. If you cannot eliminate, at least you reduce the material of concern. And uh, this is uh, basically what we plan to do. If not Thank completely you. eliminating the plastic yeah. uh, to, to reduce it as much we can and use it perhaps only as a planarization layer or adhesion layer on the cellulose. So, which means uh, cellulose is the only option for, for now at this moment. Uh, you mean uh, to replace plastic? Yes. 
Well, we're also working with uh, flexible glass for flexible substrates, which has also is very popular. Of course, it's not for all applications because it cannot be rolled too much. It's only for bendable uh, electronics. If you just want to have a curvature, then for, then flexible glass is also a good option. But again, this would increase uh, cost. Well, yeah, would increase the cost. So you need to make a cost benefit analysis at the end of the day and see uh, which uh, material and substrate is, is the best. Uh, I have another question, last question. Um, regarding the uh, TM images that you took of the devices between mm -hmm. the junction of two metals. Yes. Um, I, I'm wondering, I'm not familiar with the TM techniques. Uh, how did you prepare the sample for these images, for obtaining these images? So I am not myself an expert on the preparation, but I know that the uh, make a lamella out of uh, the film oh, and they okay. cut it sometimes they have to put a protective film the positive mm. protective film and this is uh, how it's been measured so okay. we have experts yeah. uh, in it's dm a, slicing yes uh, thin yeah. layers. Oh. exactly yeah. Yeah. it's quite co it's not easy i think uh, the measurement itself is quite simple the most uh, tricky part with dm is to fabricate the these uh, Grid. slices exactly that's the most uh, the trickiest part and fortunately our collaborators in chaos they are experts in that so we we, we still uh, send them our samples to measure Wonderful. thank you very much it was very nice presentation thank you uh do you have any applications on solar panels solar panels well i have uh, there are some ideas, but not to develop the photovoltaics with the nanogap structures, because for photovoltaics, you want a high power output. And as you can imagine, the power output you would get uh, from uh, such uh, a nanogap structure would be very small. You have small mm -hmm. area. In photovoltaics, you need a high area to have a high uh, output. So I wouldn't say these are the best option, but they could be used differently. Well, I, yeah. yeah, could be used in the field of solar cells, but not as a solar cell. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, Dimitra. Uh, thank you so much. It was a very nice presentation. So I saw that you have worked uh, quite uh, great in the development of flexible uh, sensors. Uh, I'm wondering, did you have any chance to see uh, application of these flexible electrodes for variable uh, health monitoring applications? No, this is uh, something I haven't done so far. I haven't done anything uh, in the field of healthcare. Uh, in, uh, in my current institute, so I'm based, as I said, in the electronics and computer science, and we have a very well-known group uh, in the field of bioelectronics. So there ha we have initiated some discussions on how we could bring this, uh, this technology into, the, into a different field, merging my knowledge in device physics and uh, manufacturing of electronics with their expertise in bioelectronics. So that's something that probably could come up in the next uh, couple of years. And of course, we are also always looking at for external collaborators if someone has an idea and would like to discuss yeah. it with us. Yeah, it would be very nice to uh, go for and discuss further to use the flexible answer for variable health monitoring applications. We are uh, also working on the design and the fabrication of flexible variable sensors for health monitoring applications, uh, particularly for non-invasive type of variable sensors. So it would be great chance to talk and discuss further to utilize this structure for biosensing applications. Yes, absolutely. Uh, please drop me an email and uh, we could uh, have a one-to-one -one discussion at some point. Sure, thanks. I think we finished question uh, session. Is there any question? Okay. I just have one question. Uh, sure. Um, 
Sorry, I um, I had a question. Is it possible to produce bigger gaps, for example? You show that it is a 50 nanometer gap. Could you produce, for example, the 40 nanometer, or is it possible to tune the gap size? Yes, um, in theory, yes, we can do that by changing the sum we used. If you remember when I showed the process, uh, this this gap is defined by the type the length of the sum we use, although it's not absolutely true. There are a lot of uh, mechanics uh, uh, taking place when we do the peel off uh, that also define how long or how short the gap would be. Um, we have always so far focused our efforts to make the gaps smaller, not larger, which means we can make the, the gaps larger, but we do not know how to accurately control it. So we cannot do it on demand. Say, if you want a nano gap 50 nanometers, uh, I cannot guarantee you that I will get you a 50 nanometer gap. I can, I know, I, I can definitely produce uh, larger gaps, but not in a controlled manner. Because as I said, that's something, perhaps it's possible, I'm sure it's it's possible, but that's something we haven't focused our efforts so far. Okay, to thank add you to this one, uh, let me add to this one, probably uh, it would be possible to, to elongate the alkyl chain, for example, to increase the gap, but it may not sustain, probably it will not remain elongated all the time but yes. it will be nice to have a shorter alkyl chain to bring the gap closer to it i think yeah that... you're absolutely right yes and we have done it uh, the first years when we started developing this technique we tested a range of sums with very small alkyl chains to much longer and that the one i showed is the optimum one the one that showed us the, the best yield and this is how I, why I said that although in theory you would expect just by increasing the length of the sum to get an increased gap, it's not the only, or if you like, the only critical parameter that defines the, the length. It's also the peeling mechanics uh, that, uh, and different, like the size of the metals, uh, the, their height, all those parameters can play a role in the, uh, mechanics when you do the peeling and give you a more uniform, less uniform, a larger or a smaller gap. Uh, it, I don't say it's not feasible, it is feasible. We just need uh, someone to do a dedicated project on that and to try to control it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dimitra for your presentation and thank you all participants for your participation. Thank uh, you for next, inviting me. <laughs> uh, next week, uh, we will have a uh, technology evangelist, Emrah Ince. His subject will be innovative uh, agriculture. See you next Wednesday. See you, bye. Thank you. Thank you very much, bye-bye.